Professor Tripathi, we are recording it and uh, we are also putting in our SIPA website all this uh, lecture series. Uh, so thanks very much. And uh, I'm very uh, uh, you know, happy and uh, it's our proud uh, uh, honor for all of us uh, to have you for today for our uh, 20th air quality management uh, lecture series. This is being organized jointly by uh, IIT Madras and uh, GCRF uh, SIPA network uh, uh, across uh, Asian countries. The next slide. So the, the main objective of uh, SIPA network, uh, uh, you know, uh, revolves with uh, knowledge exchange, engagement with the uh, stakeholders, networking, empowerment, and uh, innovations. Go to the next slide. So under each of these uh, objectives, uh, the SIPA network, uh, for example, we try to look at uh, the engaging the researchers, teachers, uh, and uh, experts. Uh, citizens, policymakers, and health sector officials, industry, and other uh, you know community members, which we are they are relevant to in addressing this air pollution problem. And the the second uh, uh, objective will be what works in particularly in some place uh, something may be working, and uh, uh, so there may be a learning examples from the one one cities to the other city. So we will also try to identify what is knowledge gap, what are the key challenges, how it can be addressed. Then uh, international cooperation, we thought it would be an important because sometimes the technology advancement can also bring a lot of opportunities to learn from them and also opportunities to share our experience with them. So that is also we are looking. And capacity building and capability, capability building. Uh, capacity building is this lecture series is one of such ob objective where we try to make sure that it will help them to more and more researchers to understand air quality research and try to focus this particular area. And capability building automatically when they are interested to work on this, probably they will try to focus more on advancing their understandings. Then we are also trying to see that, and uh, thanks to uh, you for generating a lot of uh, resources for us to, you know, uh, organize this kind of an event and also you know, experience and experiment several research in the area of air quality management in the country. So that is the, our last objective. Go to the next. So there are some other aspects. We also look at it uh, as a SIPA network activities. We also uh, started the uh, Prakruti as our uh, newsletter. It is quarterly newsletter. Uh, every uh, uh, four months, we one uh, newsletter we releases. We invite uh, you know articles from researchers and uh, policy makers, and we organize several panel discussion. And uh, uh, some of the documents we also plan it and put it in a local language so that it can communicate to the uh, the local uh, uh, community in a better way and the workshop symposium and also the creative drawing and also the re research outcomes uh, through some documentation next uh, so this is the overall uh, network we started this air quality management uh, uh, lecture series in october 2020 and uh, this is one of the platform we we were thinking uh, it's provide opportunities for all the young researchers to come here and uh, then experience and then plan out their research activities in the area of air quality management. Next. So these are all our past uh, uh, air quality management uh, uh, lecture series uh, speakers. Uh, we started this with the first lecture with uh, uh, Dr. B. Sengupta, former uh, member secretary of Central Pollution Control Board. Go to the next slide. And uh, uh, yeah, next slide. And the last uh, lecture was uh, given by Professor Kurvila John uh, from the University of North uh, Texas, uh, USA. And uh, we are very glad, sir, and uh, uh, today we are uh, with you. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And I request uh, you know, Gopika to introduce uh, Professor Tripathi. It is my pleasure to introduce the speaker of the day, Professor Sachdanand Tripathi. He is the professor at the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Kanpur since 2003 and was head of the department from 2018 to 21, as well as the coordinator of Center of Environmental Science and Engineering from 2014 to 17. He also holds the Arjun Deva Janmeja chair. His research focuses on air quality, climate change, and nuclear the Surup Bhatnagar Prize, the highest award in science and technology given by Government of India, is an elected fellow of Indian National Science Academy, Indian National Academy of Engineering and National Academy of Sciences India. He is also a recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Award given by 
Banaras Hindu University and UP Ratna Award given by Uttar Pradesh government. Yeah. Professor Tripathi is also the National Coordinator, National Knowledge Network, National Clean Air Program and a member of the Steering Committee of NCAP. The talk today is titled Advanced Air Quality Monitoring Technologies and Capacity Building under India's Clean Air Program, where he will be discussing the critical role played by higher technical institutions under a Rainbow Alliance, the National Knowledge Network, Institute of Repute as part of NCAP in capacity building and pro providing technical inputs to implementation agencies at all levels of governance. We will be hearing on opportunities and challenges associated with sensor-based air quality monitoring technologies, as well as the scalability of sensors-based sensors -based air quality monitoring and source apportionment using machine learning and artificial intelligence to increase the monitoring footprint in our country. So we are privileged to have you with us today and we welcome you for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Professor. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Shiva Gendra. Thank you, Sefa Network, for giving me this opportunity. And thank you to Gopika for uh, such a generous introduction. So I will share my slide and uh, we can start. But I can uh, only say that it seems uh, we can uh, create a lot of synergy between the activities of Knowledge Network and Sefa. So maybe. Uh, Shunagendra, we can discuss offline and while we are discussing, you know, the new initiative of DST will be meeting. We can discuss during that time that how uh, we can work together, right? Because these two are two are networks with very uh, some overlapping objectives. But I think maybe your network has a little larger reach outside India, so we can discuss that. Okay. So uh, let me start. I I believe. Uh, my slide is uh, visible in slide mode. Yeah, and and you, and you can hear me well, uh, Shiv. Yes, sir. We can hear you, and the slide is very clear, sir. Okay. So yes, I am going to uh, discuss some of the you know emerging technologies which one can use to increase the air quality monitoring in the country. We know that uh, the current mode of uh, monitoring is very expensive. It's all imported. So the new developments which is happening in the country, I'm uh, going to share some of those and would also share, as was mentioned in the introductions, uh, about this knowledge network, which is created as a part of National Clean Air Program and what kind of uh, nationwide capacity building programs are happening or what kind of new frameworks are on, on its way to uh, design and offer new programs so that we can have a large pool of air quality professionals available to meet the challenges of air pollution in coming years and decades. So there are uh, basically four uh, major issues which I would be discussing today. Uh, I will be talking about this uh, method which we started working some uh, few years back where one can uh, attribute sources to PM by using uh, real-time measurements, uh, mass spectrometers, et cetera. Uh, I would demonstrate some of these uses of these kind of technique for uh, understanding sources of particulate matter and non-methane volatile organic compounds. And then uh, there's a lot of development happening in the arena of low cost sensors. So I will show you that how, you know, using uh, the new uh, updates, what we have related to sensors, uh, how we are taking it from laboratory to field and new cities, city after city, some networks are getting, uh, you know, implemented. And in fact, even government and Central Pollution Control Board is also very actively working on uh, the idea of hybrid monitoring where uh, sensors can complement the monitoring done by continuous ambient air quality monitoring stations. So I will also tell uh, some of the recent developments related to that. And then a very new idea which we have been working on for last uh, couple of months or a year probably, where the data coming from sensors can itself be uh, exploited or harnessed 
using machine learning and artificial intelligence to give the sources at a hyper local scale in real time. So that is what we now call it low, low cost real time source apportionment. So that also I will discuss briefly. And then finally, as a part of this knowledge network, the kind of capacity building program which is happening in the country at different scales, at different levels, and uh, how uh, we can uh, uh, create a, a systematic uh, framework where uh, we can convert the challenges of air pollution into basically into an opportunity where we can tap the potential of the job market. As I will show you that there is a very huge uh, market ready to untap. And provided that we are up to it, we are ready. Our youth, the coming you know, generations are trained well. And definitely, I think uh, we can uh, meet these challenges by providing uh, these, you know, or by, by uh, making ourselves ready with the human resource development. So uh, let me just start with uh, first real time source apportionment of particulate matter and volatile organic gases. As you know, most of the audience here knows about particulate matter. And you know, volatile organic gases are a very important precursors to the organic aerosols, which are uh, a good part of particulate matter, which we sample in the atmosphere. So it's very important that we understand sources of both to design some effective mitigation strategy. So this slide gives you some idea that how the traditional or conventional source apportionment works, where we know that we uh, sample particulate matter on filter, then we store them, we bring it to laboratory, and we do batch analysis. And then after getting the chemical fingerprint, we run some kind of model, and then we try to get the sources. So what you are seeing here that starting from the sampling to finally sources, which is which are the bars on the very right, you see it takes about somewhere between one to two years. And therefore, uh, a lot of economic and other development happens in the intervening period. So a dynamic feedback into policy making cannot happen because of this kind of approach. Moreover, what you also see that from S1 to S7, these are different kinds of sources. There are some limitations in getting the minute details of sources from such kind of method. Because as most of you know that uh, you cannot uh, get all the fingerprints of organics and that limits your ability to resolve organic aerosols into different sources. And, and then there are some other issues as well. So what you see that certainly it's costly, it's time consuming and its ability to resolve into granular sources certainly is poor. And finally, it doesn't even give you the information uh, with a very high time frequency. So therefore, a course information on a seasonal or annual basis you get. So the critical pollution episodes can also not be, can, it's difficult to handle with such approaches. So therefore, we thought that the kind of uh, problem we had been earlier working with mass spectrometers, etc. We felt that if that can be augmented by uh, real time measurements of metals, then together the non refractory and the refractory part can be measured in real time. And then data can be inverted using some of the state of art models. In this case, we have used multi engine two to get very fine details about the sources at a very high time frequency that can be used to uh, give uh, almost dynamic, dynamic information to policymakers. And the good news here is that at many occasions now policymakers, local governments, state boards have started adopting these methods in order to deal with the critical pollution episodes. So I would be mainly showing some results from Gangetic Plain. And when I say Gangetic Plain, we have covered a good part of Delhi NCR, what you see here in the map. 
that there are three sites in Delhi NCR where we have done considerable amount of measurements in last couple of years. And then one site downwind is the capital of Uttar Pradesh, Lucknow. And I'll be showing all these real time source apportionments of particulate matter and non methane volatile organic compounds for basically these two major regions of Gangetic Plains. So this is a work which was done by my uh, for a student Bipul Lal Chandani. In fact, he just uh, moved for uh, two greener pastures to take a postdoc position at University of Birmingham. And uh, he basically, uh, you know, worked on this by having uh, three mass spectrometers deployed at three locations over Delhi NCR. One of what you see, one is near Rajendra Nagar, another at IIT Delhi, and third one as the Mano Rajna International University. So what you see that these three very much lie on a corridor during winter time. So it's a northwest to southeast corridor, which is the major pathway for transport of particulate matter and gases during that time in Delhi and CR. So it also gave some, us some good idea that what is the contribution of local and what's contribution from the transported or you know other kind of sources. So what you notice that uh, we could get some very fine information about the particulate matter and moreover we get a uh, reasonably accurate information about the organic part of it, which is challenging if you try to get this information from filter based information, uh, filter based sampling. Moreover, what is even interesting here is that you can get a very uh, good idea about the sources of organics because the all the very detailed molecular level information we get about organics uh, that if you are able to uh, you know process it well and then work with some of these advanced uh, models like as i said multi engine 2 etc uh, you can get a very good idea about sources so in this case what you see that all three sites broadly exhibit very similar kind of composition that shows that that uh, you know that is a very regional uh, nature of the pollution over Delhi and CR, and what you also see that organics can be resolved very very well between OOA, which is oxygen oxygenated organic aerosol, then uh, oxygenated also this solid fuel uh, related carbon, and then third is the HOA, which is hydrocarbon like organic aerosols, which comes from the regular. Uh, pollution and most of this what you say uh, see here is that that good part of organic is basically uh, soa here which is secondary organic aerosol so broadly speaking what you see here that winter time half of the non refractive particulate matter in delhi is coming from organic and about half of this organic is secondary in nature so broadly speaking in winter time one fourth of total non refractory particulate matter could be secondary organic. And if you add secondary inorganic to it, that fraction even goes a little more. And this is what, as I said, that you can get this information on a very, you know, uh, highly resolved time scale that what it's shown in the left hand side plot that you see the organic or nitrate sulfate ammonium, chloride, and then there's a ethylometer that was running to give black carbon. So all this information, what you get, you can actually uh, uh, obtain at a diurnal scale. And that can help you understand if there are some kind of episodic pollution. And because you are resolving sources also on that scale, as I will show uh, in the later slides, uh, it gives you a very important lever that can be used to, of course, uh, do something about it, intervene into that. And that is what you see on the right hand side here that across the three sites, IIT Delhi, then Rajendra Nagar and Manorashna, all these uh, speciation or species of PM 2.5 are plotted as a function of day. And that again gives you a very good idea that what are the time of the day 
where maximum exposure to the humans are happening. And this again can be very well uh, be used to design an effective air quality management strategy, be it Delhi NCR or any other place for that matter. So if uh, now I move to the summer part, that was for winter, then we, we did a similar exercise for summer. And uh, if you look at the uh, high level information that what was the main composition of particulate matter in summer. So what you see that the key difference is that organic still contributes to a, a very, uh, uh, to a greater, uh, you know, extent. But in summer, that contribution of SOA, relative contribution of SOA is even more than winter. So because uh, of, you know, abundant sunlight, certainly organics can be easily processed and that gets converted into secondary. So although the total PM in summer, particularly for 29, non-refractory PM was way lesser than the previous year winter time, but the contribution from secondary is way higher. That's what showing is the 49 or 50 percent, only LBOA. Another interesting source I should also point out was identified here is the cooking organic. So that shows that, you know, uh, there is a good contribution that is also coming from the, the gases which are emitted from cooking and then get processed and finally ends up into condensing into the organic part of the uh, particulate matter. So earlier there were some, you know, hints uh, in, in past studies that the cooking aerosols also uh, or cooking can contribute to organic aerosols as a source, but it could never be resolved in such a way and this time in summer in, in this particular work it could be resolved in a very fine way and here as I was uh, telling earlier that earlier I showed that you can get a very highly time resolved speciation and because at the scale or the time scale you are getting the speciation on the same time scale you can also get sources that is what is shown here for summer that what you see on the left there are basically these five major sources starting with HOA which is coming from traffic then you have solid fuel combustion and then you have cooking organic aerosol you have semi-volatile which is more uh, urban in nature and then you have uh, little volatile oxygenated organic aerosol the last panel which is more regional in the nature regional and sometimes it can also have some uh, local component into that and some of them also have been co-plotted with external markers what we say that for example that what is shown in the very top panel is the traffic related sources can be correlating well with the the fossil fuel part of the black carbon so black carbon what we are we are measuring you can do you can use a very simple two component model to resolve black carbon into a fossil fuel and solid fuel uh, so solid fuel is more like a uh, biofuel like uh, woods etc and fossil fuel is more like petrol diesel or some other stuff so that is what shows that in some cases you can use some external markers to corroborate your finding that is what is shown here and likewise these sources can also be seen at a diagonal scale so it gives you a very good idea if, if you know you're working uh, as a air quality manager these are some very useful information which earlier were not available so for example, what you see that evening time, there are a couple of sources which are very prominent at probably 8 to 9 uh, p.m. That is basically the vehicular and then cooking and some part of even solid fuel combustion. So, you know, uh, you, are, you are getting this information and then definitely either you can intervene by mitigating it, stopping it, or you can some way uh, issue advisories, etc., to the citizens who are traveling outside, etc. And and I'm not showing uh, those plots here. You can actually couple these time series with uh, the wind data to locate the sources, to get the geographical locations of sources in a very precise way. And that, of course, can lead to actually identifying and spotting some of the large point sources 
and then of course the regulators can go after them and certainly bring them to the or take actions to bring them to the compliance level uh, this is a uh, slightly a different work we did in the following year which was again uh, was done by my student people Dal Chandani. Uh, there uh, we again deployed the set of instrumentations which are able to measure the real-time speciation of particulate matter at two sites at Delhi and CR. One was IIT Delhi, another was Rajendra Nagar. And our goal here was to understand the genesis and the reasons behind the haze events in Delhi. As we all know that from October to December, Delhi generally experienced two or three haze events. The haze events generally you can define that when particulate matter actually exceeds a certain amount. Maybe it could be 100 microgram per meter cube or 120 microgram per meter cube, something like that. You can define that. And then if it's exceeding that, those are the periods where what we see that uh, is a great reduction in visibility and then all other sort of problems follow. So what you see on left is basically that for uh, different kind of periods, so what you see overall, then there's a clean, then AGVs, agriculture burning, and then there is a haze one, haze two, haze three, and likewise, then again, you have overall, and then those again periods are shown here in these stack bar, which is over IIT Delhi, and this Rajendra Nagar. And what you see that at both sides, the non-refractory particulate matter that is excluding metal and black carbon, the particulate matter average number for two or two and a half months are very high, 82 microgram per meter cube and 100.105 microgram per meter cube. So very high number. And what you also see that these colors show that in this case, they show the composition organic to black carbon, what is here. And on the right stack bar, it's showing that what are the sources which are contributing to these different type of periods from clean to different hazy periods. So we are mostly going to focus on a particular haze and or basically agriculture burning period. We want to understand that why do we say this is an agriculture burning period? Can we pinpoint and attribute sources which are actually contributing to it? So we, we looked deeply into the composition of particulate matter we tried to understand its sources. We backed up this analysis with other additional, uh, you can say tracers, which were available to us from the volatile organic compound measurements. And then we finally, we could probably get some understanding of what's going on here. So that is what we are showing here. Again, the plots are designed for IIT or organized in a way it's for IIT Delhi and this IIT Madras, uh, sorry, uh, IITM uh, Rajendra Nagar for, and there are few major species we have chosen to basically differentiate between this agriculture biomass burning and rest of the period, okay? So we are showing here is for organics, then black carbon and its wood burning part. Then you have biomass burning part two, which is not very oxidized then we have already understood this little volatile oxygenated organic aerosol, which is a highly oxidized part of organic aerosol, which certainly has spent good time or has been chemically processed very rapidly. Either of those two might have happened in the atmosphere. Then there is another component of biomass burning organic aerosol three, which is uh, relatively more oxidized or aged. And finally, there is an acetonitrile. As you know, that is a very prominent volatile organic compound that generally comes from biomass burning. So it's a very, very, uh, uh, what you call, uh, important tracer for understanding the biomass burning sources. And what you notice that across two sites, during a culture biomass burning periods, all these species are exhibiting higher amount compared to the, the rest of the period. Be it organics, you see the green curve, or if you look the wood burning part of black carbon, or you look at LVOA, or even if you look at acetonitrile, it's very clearly showed that a period from 24th October to 16th November in 2019, 
which actually showed very high amount of particulate matter. In fact, it also coincide, coincided with the, some of the festive seasons that time, three, four days. And really uh, that air quality of Delhi NCR became very, very poor, okay? In fact, I think for several days or weeks, it was designated in the severe category. And we could clearly understand that what is going on here. We saw that there were certainly a huge contribution to LVO from photochemical production is happening. And then also at the same time, whatever there's a biomass burning happening while traveling or biomass burning produced, uh, you know, uh, all these uh, stuff while it's traveling to NCR, it got oxidized and that is why we are sampling a lot of that at sites of IIT Delhi and other places, okay? So this was uh, another interesting, uh, you can say, example of having, uh, having been able to measure uh, the things in real time and in a very highly resolved way in, at molecular level, okay? So that was is the advantage of that. Now, uh, I would just show some of the similar stuff what we have obtained from Lucknow because I, in the earlier in my talk, I said in the very beginning that we'll be showing the results from Delhi and also from Lucknow. And that's how we are covering a good part of uh, Gangetic Plains. So in Lucknow, again, I'm showing here the non-refractory particulate matter here on the left, its composition and what is the basically contribution from various sources. So what you see that, that average particulate matter from December to May in Lucknow is comparable to Delhi. It's not very high or very low than what we have seen in Delhi. It's almost comparable. One interesting thing is that contribution of organic is even higher in Lucknow. Relative percentage is higher in Lucknow compared to Delhi. And if you add these solid fuel part, the solid fuel combustion contribution in Lucknow is certainly way higher than what was observed in Delhi. That means there is a lot of combustion activities which are happening in Lucknow is actually contributing to particulate matter 2.5 in Lucknow. And this is what, again, uh, you could actually get these sources at a very fine time resolution that is shown here. All these uh, basically in Lucknow was resolved into a traffic source uh, urban pollution, I mean, you can think about SBOA more like a urban kind of urban source for organic aerosols, whereas LVOA is more like a regional source. And then what you see, we could really resolve very clearly two sources of solid fuel combustion. And then, and in fact, there were one or two episodic pollution. For example, if you look at the very bottom panel, so what you see that uh, in the second or third week of January, there was certainly some large, uh, you know, biomass burning events were happening, which has led to this uh, rise in the SFC OA part of the solid fuel combustion organic aerosol right here in the turquoise color. And then, of course, a similar information you can get yeah, at the, uh, in the diurnal form. So it's, it gives us a good idea to compare that what is the organic aerosol composition and contribution from various sources at a mega city like Delhi and a large capital of a very large state of India that is Lucknow. And what you notice here is that the traffic in Lucknow contribution from traffic is less, is significantly lesser, is 13% and in Delhi it is 20%, but contribution from solid fuel combustion is way higher. It's almost two, factor of two more in Lucknow compared to Delhi. So what you see that these kind of information certainly can be used while we are moving towards having a, a regional air quality management plan, right? When you have information about Delhi and CR, if you have information about Lucknow, such fine grain granular information about source contribution and then you can use them to design an effective regional air quality management program or uh, plan 
And if you have, let's say, some measurement going on uh, somewhere between or in between these two capitals, then you could also design or use them to design a proper air shed management, which probably would be uh, determining the air quality of these two very kind of different regions. So that is where such measurements can play a very, very important role. Now, from non-refractory part, I'm now moving to the refractory part because refractory part is equally important as probably some of you know, that basically comes from the all the elemental or metal part of particulate matter. They certainly contribute in a significant way. So their mass is relatively less than non-refractory, generally speaking, but many of them are very detrimental to human health because they certainly are coming out from, so first of all, some of these metals are carcinogens. So even at trace amount, they can uh, cause a great, uh, you know, damage to human health. And second, they also can act as very important tracers in conjunction with what we have obtained from uh, the, our earlier measurements to get a better information about sources. So from both perspectives, having simultaneous measurements of non-refractory and metals definitely would be very, very useful, right? So here, what we are showing is first for the summer, that what was the metal composition of particulate matter 2.5 at the IIT Delhi site. As you see on the left, again, uh, the pie shows that what is the contribution or what is the composition of PM2.5 when you dissolve it into different metals. So there is this instrument exact, which is a real time metal monitor can give you uh, very precise information at a PPB level, PPB level for about 25 to 30 metals. Okay, and that is what is shown here. And then a similar kind of model like multi-engine two you can use to resolve the sources for metals only. So what you see that, not surprisingly, in summer over Delhi or IIT Delhi, a majority of PM2.5 refractory part is coming from dust. And you can also get some very uh, fine, again, granular information, for example, a break and tire wear. So these are some of the interesting information which generally you do not get from the earlier conventional uh, you know, measurements. And then also some of these uh, group of metals, for example, uh, zinc and arsenic or lead and selenium. Lead and selenium can indicate towards a power plant, but sulfur rich can indicate for more spurious kind of coal burning. So that is what is the additional piece of information you are getting from having very, again, uh, very well resolved and highly resolved in time about metals. Add a uh, similar information. Now you can get the source source time series, which is additional, you know, great piece of information. So what you see, all those sources are basically shown here. These are non-exhaust, then dust. So you see the there is third one, which is a chlorine rich. So chlorine rich, generally one can attribute to steel or garbage burning. So, you know, this kind of information uh, is rather difficult to get from the conventional source of portionment, right? Because you will not be able to resolve a factor which is only dominated by chlorine rich. And then you can use an external marker like ammonium. And if you have a very high correlation co a coefficient here of about 0.5, which is reasonably good, you can say with uh, reasonable certainty that it is probably coming from this particular industry. Or as I said that this is a sulfur rich, you can correlate with sulfate. Okay. And of course, you can again look into its diagonal pattern. So uh, again, we uh, use the same uh, uh, measurements for the winter time, for which I showed just the, the uh, re, uh, re, uh, genesis and reasons behind the haze events for October to December 2019. Now I'm presenting that uh, metal information for the same period. 
okay? And in a very similar format, now you have become familiar with this format. Here, what we are showing is the elemental contribution, and here what we are showing is the relative source contribution. And what you see here is the dust, which was a prominent source, has dropped to only 8%. And in summer, you see it was actually occupying half of the pie. And instead, now this chlorine-rich source has really taken a big chunk of this pie by going to the 33%. So you see some this very uh, interesting piece of information can emerge from all this, right? And uh, then again, uh, the source information you are getting because you have 15 minute data or half an hour data. So you can resolve sources at that time scale. And that is what is plotted here. So what you see like uh, very interesting that I believe as I was telling that, yes, it was the last week of October when actually uh, Diwali occurred and we could clearly, you know, resolve this firework here. Okay, so you see that exactly on the day of Diwali from a day prior, you start seeing rise in the metal contribution coming from fireworks. It would reach maxima on the Diwali day and then it goes away. It's just like a very, very, what you call, like a step function that's going at a some time to a infinity and then drops. And that, of course, also if it uh, coincides with the culture biomass burning, you know that what kind of, uh, you know, impact it can have on Delhi's air quality. And now I'm showing similar information for Lucknow. We also have done these measurements over Lucknow from December 2020 to last year, middle of last year, which is May. And, uh, you know, uh, that is what is presented here. On the left is the elemental composition. And on the right, you have the source contribution. And interestingly, what we found in Lucknow, that for metals, that sulfur rich, which is indicating to some one or two major power plants, which is actually contributing in a disproportionate net proportionate way to the metal uh, part of particulate matter in Lucknow because of the existing meteorological conditions that time. And that's what you see here is that almost one fourth of the pie is occupied by sulfur rich sources. So it would again make sense that if you compare Delhi and Lucknow here, what you see that in Delhi, the average PM 2.5 elemental part of it is 17. And in Lucknow is slightly lesser, but what you see that if you compare that power power contribution or contribution from power plant is one fourth here, which is way lesser in Delhi. So there are some again distinct differences in the metal composition also is appearing. So what now what you want to do is that you want to for the ease of policy making. The people who take decisions or people, regulators who want to intervene uh, to, you know, stop deterioration of air quality, either uh, during an episodic case or in general, who wants to basically, uh, you know, uh, make air quality meet the national air quality standard for whatever, either of these reasons. For them, this information is way too granular and rich, and they generally want the information in a simple way. How can we go about that? That these two sets of information, which are coming from the non-refractory sources and measurement and refractory sources and measurement, can you combine them? And answer is yes, we can combine them using a double PMF approach. So that is what is approach we are working now, where what you see that on these, this pink box on the top of this cartoon is the information which is coming from the AMS. Then you have athelometer, which is giving a black carbon, and you have exact, which is giving a metal. And then you try to combine them all. And then all these sources which you get from the AMS, you combine them with the metal data, and then you create this grand matrix and feed them into this uh, receptor models, which is in this case, again, is ME2, so that you can get sources which are more intuitive, which are shown here, right? 
instead of providing separate sources in those two isolated uh, set of or piece of you know measurements and that is what we are doing currently now and it has uh, uh, it's giving some very very interesting results i just want to show it here for uh, delhi over rajendra nagar which is uh, one of the mos lab is there so we have actually combined all these in pieces of information what we had over rajendra nagar and by combining them but you see we could resolve into 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and 10 sources and then we have done a significant amount of a rigorous statistical analysis because when you are combining these two you really need that your solution passes all those rigorous statistical tests so that's very very important and that has been done here and but definitely a uh, much you know a uh, more holistic and comprehensive information about sources emerges from that and hopefully i think such information can also be uh, you know taken or welcomed by the policy makers and be used by them in the in coming days for the air quality management so now from particulate matter i would like to move to now real time source apportionment of non methane volatile organic compounds as I mentioned that these are important because some of them are carcinogenic, they can cause cancer and can have other associated adverse health impacts. But it's also important that from the point of view that they, when they travel in atmosphere, they can convert into heavier molecules and finally condense in particulate matter, giving rise to the organic part of PM. And therefore, if an effective strategy would be to understand the sources of both so that one can mitigate them or certainly uh, remove or plug them. So this is one uh, work what was done over Delhi some time back where we uh, did these measurements. Of course, you need to use a different kind of instruments which is called PTRMS, Proton Transfer Reactive Mass Spectrometry. It is different from aerosol mass spectrometry. It is also mass spec, but the technique it uses is totally different from the technique which is used by aerosol mass spectrometer. So these measurements were done in winter of 2018 at IIT Delhi and Manorashna. And what we found that there were the very distinct, uh, you know, sources which were operating. So sources, categories were not distinct, but the relative contributions were actually more distinct. So as we saw in the case of aerosols, generally the kind of or number of factors were similar across three sites. That was also true in the case of non-methane volatile organic compounds over these two very, you know, different sites, one in center of Delhi, one downwind of Delhi. So if you look at here that traffic contributed more to these VOCs over IIT Delhi compared to Mano Rashna. Solid fuel combustion, the contribution at Mano Rashna was more and then when it comes to oxygenated, the, those are uh, compounds which, you know, after emissions, of course, have undergone some, uh, you know, chemical reactions and have become little higher in molecular weight, etc. This was a uh, little more at Manorachna site. And again, what is shown here is that basically the, the time, time series of these, again, these three uh, big baskets or buckets of sources like traffic and solid fuel combustion and the oxidized part of that can be further split into two each. So what you see here is that you have traffic one and traffic two, solid fuel combustion one and two, and two kind of these secondary volatile organic compound. I will just show you here over IIT Delhi that there is a traffic one and traffic two. The diurnal variation of these two are significantly different. And that could hint at that basically traffic two is more related to these heavy duty vehicles which operate or allowed to fly only night time because of some of the restrictions that time posed by the court and other authorities to ease out Delhi's air quality that time. Now this you see, you could see the differences between traffic one and two. Likewise, you can also see the differences into these other kind of sources. And if you compare between 
uh, Mano Rashna and IIT Delhi sites, you see there is still significant amount of you know differences in the diagonal pattern and relative contribution from these six sources to the overall pi of non-methane volatile compound source. Okay. So what we have also done, we had a year of measurement over IIT Delhi that was only presented for winter comparing the two sides. We also have had measurements over IIT Delhi across the full year of 2019. And that is what is shown here is basically contributions from these again six sources. But in one case, we have also resolved now a solvent use, like something when you use in the photocopier and sometime a biogenic source, you know, something which is coming from the uh, forest or thick, you know, tree, uh, woods, etc. Woods means that life, life trees. And that is what is shown here in different pies for winter, summer, monsoon, and post monsoon. So, a very, uh, you can say that uh, a very clear climatology of the sources of these volatile organic compounds over a prominent site in Delhi is presented here. And there are some very distinct, uh, you know, features which one could see as the weather changes. For example, we saw that during monsoon time, or uh, post monsoon, the biogenic emissions start showing up, right? So, for some reason, that forests, the kind of VOCs they are emitting is actually now uh, certainly is getting sampled and popping up in the sources we have here. And that is what, again, this information is shown in the part, you know, where the time series and is diagonal part, and this just got accepted in atmospheric environment. I think it already is has appeared online. It's the work is done uh, by my current PhD student, Vaishali Jain. And uh, we are continuing a similar, uh, you know, effort by by having these measurements at Lucknow site. We, uh, we run that PTRMS at Lucknow when we were running the other set of instruments during the campaign over Lucknow. And now we have uh, looked into the data again by Vashali Jain, and uh, we have tried to resolve uh, in different sources of these non-methane volatile organic compounds in Lucknow. This work is almost completed and hopefully we'll be able to submit it soon. And this is an interesting piece actually over uh, Lucknow. You see that uh, if you look at traffic or biomass burning, the bars with different colors shows that what are the prominent volatile organic compounds which actually contribute to or give rise to determination of these sources. So, for example, if you look at the transport, so you see the transport has a major contributions coming from the CHO1, okay? On the other hand, if you look traffic, uh, most of the contribution is coming from the CXHY, like, you know, these kind of, uh, what you call, uh, long chain, um, aliphatic, hydrocarbons, okay? So, again, uh, it is in order that we look at these two sets of information over Delhi and Lucknow, and this is what is shown for non-methane volatile organic compound sources, that, and there is a very clear, some differences are emerging, you see, and it is very consistent with what we have seen in the case of contributions to the particulate matter 2.5, if you recall, that for particulate matter 2.5, major contribution was coming from solid fuel or relative, relatively higher contribution at Lucknow was from solid fuel combustion compared to Delhi. And similarly also, you can see that for non-methane volatile organic compounds, this contribution is 36% at Lucknow and it's only 28% at Delhi. So, you know, the two sets of information are actually matching quite well with each other. So that means that it's a very uh, kind of a, uh, the overall study and its findings are going in the right direction. And hopefully this all uh, could find its way when we design uh, some kind of regional air quality management in coming days. So now I will uh, switch gears a little bit and I will move to the sensors networks, which we are currently working on. And I will show that 
what kind of methods we have used for calibration and by you know uh, doing some uh, in field calibration experiments for example in the case of mumbai and in which city now we have census networks already running and how is their performance when we are evaluating the sensors by co-locating with the BAM run by individual labs or by government uh, agencies or regulators. So they are, here is uh, currently this maps looks like what you see here, all the yellow uh, circles where a uh, network is running currently and all the blue ones where we are soon going to apply uh, or, you know, um, basically deploy these networks. And we use certain uh, a rather set of subjective criteria. As of now, we do not have a very objective method met based on hard mathematical or theoretical approach while uh, selecting uh, while selecting the sites and the size of the network up for a particular city. This is a very interesting problem. We have started thinking in that direction and hopefully we'll have a more objective way by using some kind of optimization methods to uh, you know choose the number of sites and size of the network which can give us optimal desired information which we need to safeguard people's health in the cities so the, here is a, a work which we did in mumbai we had a experiment that ran through november 2019 uh, 2020 to may 2021 for about 8 months uh, involving four type of startups who brought different sensor units which were deployed across 15 government monitors in the metropolitan of Mumbai. So altogether there are 40 sensors and what you see here is that we used uh, some kind of a machine learning model DNN and we found that first of all the sensors uptime were reasonably high comparable to the CEAQMS or BAM part of CEAQMS measured data and we could see that the good sensors could have an R square of 0.85 to 0.9 and with a mean absolute percentage error below uh, 10%. So that work was done in collaboration with one of my colleague of electrical engineering Bipul Arora which and of course in collaboration with Maharashtra Pollution Control Board, they are part of this entire work as well as the publication. So this work got published last year in IEEE Census. And as a follow up to that, we also try to basically uh, develop a method where we can reduce the overall duration of co-location because see in the field, it's not pos possible that all sensors can be co located with the government monitor all the time, right? So only few sensors can be co-deployed and that even co-deployment time also eventually needs to be reduced. So you want to work, we want to work with the co-located data, develop a calibration model, which be applicable across the network, that's the idea. So in this work, we again used a different set of machine learning model which is called, uh, some ways called meta learning model. These approaches are which model can learn while it's trying to mimic the data, okay? This has the ability to learn on the go, you can say. This work also uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, gave us some very interesting information because at many co-located sites, we use the model, uh, the data, and then apply this meta learning approach to apply the calibration model to other other sites and uh, basically the performance or the results were uh, very very encouraging so this was a follow up work again done in collaboration with maharashtra pollution control board and that got published in ieee sensors letters only this year and this is a work done little before this Maharashtra uh, co-located, uh, you know, field evaluation experiment where we looked into the efficacy and precision of gas sensors, which were part of another earlier work, uh, you know, uh, funded by Department of Science Technology, IUSSTF, 
where we deployed gas sensors at Delhi and Mumbai next to these reference gas analyzers. And we uh, applied a set of machine learning models, which are actually shown here, different kind of models. And we found that, and then we swapped these sensors so that we can look into their performance across two sites. And interestingly, we found that, that uh, models like K and N, uh, K nearest neighbor with machine learn, uh, learning uh, could give us some very uh, good performance in, in the case of ozone sensors, R square can go up to 0 0.88, 0 0.9, and for NOx, it could go up to 0 0.85. So this was actually work done in collaboration with our computer science colleague, Professor Pushottam Kar, and it was published last year in Atmospheric Measurement Technology, and it was led by my postdoc, Dr. Ravi Sahu. Now, uh, this slide shows that as of now, we are running a, a relatively large network in Lucknow of about 73 sensors. And this shows basically the time series at three government monitoring sites, what you see at BR Ambedkar, Gomti Nagar, and Cook Rail, where the, the UPPCB has three CAQMS running. And together with that, we are also showing the sensor data. And on the right, basically over a couple of months of data, we are showing you the the regression and what you see that reasonably good performance these sensors are showing with r square ranging from 0.7 to 0.8 and these are uncalibrated these are raw data just some quality control or assurance have been applied but no calibration is applied and you are getting a mean performance with r square of about 0.75 and a mean percentage error of about 10 to 12 percent and similarly, here I'm showing for Jaipur, a very similar performance you are seeing for Jaipur here with R square of about 0 0.7 to 0 0.75. Again, in a very similar way, sensors are placed next to the government monitors at these two sites. So Lucknow, actually, we are moving ahead to do some hotspot, uh, you know, identification. I will not show because this work is very much in progress. But this just gives you an idea that how the Lucknow network currently looks like. This is the red one is the outer boundary of Lucknow city. And with that, all these sensors with different colors show that, you know, different areas and why all those uh, have been deployed here. And uh, we, we have now started developing some, uh, you know, set of, you can say, conditions, algorithms to identify the hot spots in Lucknow and look into its climatology. And uh, there's some very preliminary results here are I'm showing to you that these pink sites are showing that that, that occasionally at given uh, duration of measurements, these are these are actually emerging as hot spots. So we have to actually uh, go deeper into that, substantiate these results with other ancillary measurements and we'll definitely will take it forward. As I, in the beginning, I mentioned that I will also very briefly mention about the, uh, the low cost source apportionment. Why do we want to do low cost, real time, low cost, but real time source apportionment. So as we mentioned that the offline is slow, it takes time and it doesn't give you granular information. And of course, it also takes a, uh, sorry, this is the first slide. And it also takes a lot of time and effort. Right? On the other hand, real time can give you highly granular information. So you see, instead of a snail, you are running it, but cost of deployment is very high and resource training and resource requirement is also very high. So it, this cannot be scaled everywhere. On the other hand, what you know, that low cost sensors are scalable. Once you determine their accuracy and efficacy, you can scale it across the cities and that is the direction I think uh, the world is moving. So what we are doing here is that we are placing the set of these sensors next to the, the entire infrastructure of real time source apportionment. And then if you can train them, then what you see that instead of running, instead of what we call that, uh, you know, leapfrogging, you can do pole vaulting. You see, you are running even faster without losing any granularity from S 
source 1 to S7, you are getting all. And you could essentially get it as, as many places you can co-deploy or you can move around the real time source apportionment infrastructure. So that is the direction we are working on now. And we call it uh, a SAGE, which is source apportionment via regression ensembles. Okay. So here is one piece of information I'm just showing you that we have done this training over Delhi with the low of the low cost sensors with the real time source apportionment data. And I'm showing that how one particular factor that is HOVA, hydrocarbon like organic aerosol, we, uh, is shown here, right? One coming from the model, another coming from the measurement. And you see, we could get it with a very high level of confidence of R square of about 0.15. And in fact, if you can look into bin wise these errors, so what you see that more majority of where the majority of the data is available in these bars, actually, you you can get the information with even higher confidence. So that is the actually the direction currently we are taking, and that is the way where I believe that in future things will happen in order to get to is to scale the source uh, identification over uh, the cities in a affordable way. That is where we have to probably move. So now I have a couple of slides. I think I will probably wrap up in a couple of minutes. I said that as a part of knowledge network, which is uh, uh, de designated a think tank status by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change as a part of National Clean Air Program, which has two major mandates. One is, as some of you know, to identify the institutes of repute who could help uh, the urban local bodies by providing te technical inputs in effective implementations or efficient implementation of clean air program. And second mandate given to the knowledge network is to impart capacity building. We know that in air quality management as a whole, we are a short of you know, adequate capacity in the country. And that is where we are trying to put our efforts together. So, uh, one work what knowledge network did in collaboration with many institutions which are listed here on the bottom we ran through a six weeks or six more than six weeks i think from early february to middle of march yes six weeks we ran a very tight uh you know training program one on induction training another on city action plans where 400 participants actually you know finally participated and uh, their overall uh, you know, uh, distribution uh, looks like that. There were people from institutes of repute, consultants, from pollution control board, etc. And there was a minor fraction also, which came from the urban local body official, but hopefully in future, this number will certainly go up. And the second task is to create a framework. So this was the beginning. We did it the first such program, but idea is to create a framework which can be used to formulate and offer such programs, which I said in the beginning, which is more specific, targeted to train the future air quality professionals in the country, okay? So in that, uh, you know, again, uh, basically, oh, this slide is a repeat, let's uh, just uh, ignore this slide. And uh, so, yeah, coming, just going back to that, that the training program actually has these sets of mainly you know topics which was the health related impacts monitoring network introduction to city action plan air shed capacity modeling etc cetera, etc cetera, and all the details are here right now as i said that how do we go about for making such programs you know as a more like a regular feature and which can also provide the skills which are needed to create such professionals in future so basically a very massive exercise was done by this consortium and we uh, tried to look into that what kind of courses currently are run in the country and this stack bar you know is showing that most of the courses are very basic and in communication of course you have the least number of courses and others are somewhere in between okay and then a full need based assessments were done through online general survey and also meeting people physically 
and all these you know details are given here i don't want to go into that but what we finally see that there are these subsectors of air quality management where in future the air quality managers air quality professionals would be required to contribute and they are running from air quality management in general to air quality monitoring ambient air quality monitoring inventory all these are the major major issues which future air quality managers need to be trained with and where are these uh, or where uh, would they be needed so you know different organizations which would go from the ministry to the regulator to these uh, technical institutions consulting firms urban local bodies air polluting industries or the industries who are making instrumentation media personnel and in some cases even financial economic institutions and health agencies and all put together there is a huge potential to generate jobs of the order of a million jobs in coming few years and that is where that the overall exercise what was done as a part of this was to create some working groups and finally you can map from these to the activities using activities discussion exercises so that that uh, the future capacity building or training programs can be linked to the national skill qualification framework which runs from a scale 1 to scale 9 or scale 10 depending on what kind of jobs one is looking for and so that people are adequately trained when they enter into the job market and can cater to the need of the overall you see air quality management here and that is what basically is the final slide i have here that the training need assessment mapping of the jobs then you have to assess at what skill level you are looking for and then you try to then start creating the modules in that way for that target group and finally what you see that that outcome is shown here and hopefully i think this would uh act as a uh, maybe a foundation or as a framework uh, which certainly will be used in future to create such kind of capacity building program so i will i will stop it here thank you i think i have taken slightly uh, i have overrun the time a little bit but uh, i think i can still if there are some time i can take some questions thank you thank you professor tripathi it was a wonderful talk and uh, i know you have explained so much advanced uh, requirement in addressing this complex air quality uh, problems uh, thank you very much uh, uh, maybe we will uh, start uh, some discussions and uh, some questions are already there in the chat box and uh, some of you have some questions please uh, type in the chat box Uh, Professor Tripathi, I just wanted to uh, start a discussion. We know air quality management standards uh, is a very, you know, almost uh, uh, decades old, and uh, we made some changes uh, recently. But as you, your research currently shows that the new emerging pollutants are coming into picture, and that something which is we should be start concerning. And uh, now, uh, what you? Uh, think uh, in terms of coming out with the standards uh, do we need also uh, make some suggestions uh, in terms of uh, you know because your research is also bringing some information uh, so that that may can and uh, well any beneficial for developing some new standards yes i mean uh, definitely i think cpcb has set up a committee to revisit the standard and so that's certainly they would uh, visit revisit all those you know seven eight uh, criterion pollutants and their standard but as you rightly said that i believe uh, it's time that we um, expand the scope of those standards by by bringing uh, maybe as you rightly said uh, some of the you know metals which are very carcinogenic i think uh, you know just keeping to pm 2.5 may not help so if individually those metals cannot be uh, really monitored one can always see that they might be co highly correlated with ultra fine right so then ultra fine is not a part of standard so some some of these things can be really thought up so pcb i believe has set up a committee and i hope they would look into these things in a very holistic and comprehensive way because while we are you know trying to take head on with air pollution in this country it's time that we we think ahead 
uh, you know, before without waiting for the other issues to crop up, right? And start dealing with them right now. Thank you, Professor Party. My other question, which uh, also uh, curious to know from you as an experienced person, uh, how do we link uh, some of this uh, climate policies with our current uh, air quality issues? Uh, because both of them are a different scale and uh, somehow we are not interlinking them. Uh, uh, so what we, since you have a lot of experience in that area, so how do we, how, so what do you think as a roadmap we should move forward so that we can br bring closer to both air quality and uh, climate uh, policies together? Well, I, I believe that at the central, uh, you know, level, right? They and and but and in some cases, at state level, they are trying to, uh, you know, create a synergy between uh, various policies of government, so that uh, you know, uh, one can achieve the twin benefits of that is, as you are saying, that mitigating uh, climate change and also air pollution, and of course. The benefits out, out, out of that would be too many, including, you know, the avoidable health risks to the people and all. Uh, but at the city level, uh, I believe that uh, a lot is still, uh, uh, you know, needs to be done. And uh, uh, certainly, I think uh, city officials need to start thinking. And uh, they have been given, I think, this... 17 uh, sustainable development goals uh, and that's very much a part of that you know whenever you talk about any city development official who are part of the city development council uh, through the ministry of urban uh, you know housing etc uh, that how do you deal with this uh, how do you achieve these sdgs but uh, i think uh, you, they, uh, uh, there is a need to you know uh, go beyond that start developing more quantitative framework, start thinking about what kind of, you know, planning is required so that you can break the nexus between the energy, water, food, transportation. How do you design them, plan them so that every action you take actually reduces or minimizes the carbon footprint. At the same time, it really, you know, goes towards reducing their pollution. So that requires, again, I think the city, at city level, we need more experts who can help city managers, city administrators to design things in a way, right? Which is uh, looking at the things in a more holistic way rather than, you know, looking at the things in a more isolated way. Thank you, Professor Mitribhati. So before we take up some of the questions in the chat box, I request all of you to just uh, start your camera so that we'll have one uh, picture with uh, Professor Tripathi. Swarup, are you ready? You are able to see? Dheeraj yeah. uh, or Ashwin, you can you take a picture and then... Uh... You know, once you complete, then we'll start continuing the questions. It's done, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dibhati, there's one question in the chat. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. The first question says uh, high split uh, trajectory model locate uh, uh, local and regional sources to locate potential sources. Uh, so they have simulated trajectories, trajectories at different elevations like uh, 50 meter, 100 meter, etc. Uh, to perform a, a trajectory statistical analysis like a PSCF and a CWT analysis. They have used the ground monitoring stations data. Can you please uh, let me know how the ground station can be represent pollutant at a certain elevation? What are the another approaches to deal with such a problem? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, it's true that for CWT is that is what they call concentrated weighted trajectory. 
is a very good way to combine you know the uh, high frequency time series of either the composition of sources and with the this wind data to precisely locate uh, the sources right that's the uh, i think is a way people do about it now i'm not sure that what kind of ground station data they are using because ground uh, station data uh, cannot uh, if it's a ca qms data for example then it's not giving you any idea about the you know the tracer or the sources so i don't know uh, what is their his aim and what kind of or her aim and how or what kind of ground level data they are using because generally we use the ground level data but the ground level data if your if your goal is to determine in some way that what are the clusters of sources that is contributing to the receptor site the sampling site you need to have a very tight time series of the sources resolved at the receptor site right okay that is the way work now if you have that i don't see there should be a problem if you are using a ca qms kind of information then i don't know what you can get from that so okay maybe, yeah. yeah thank you i think it, it, you uh, gave the information so that it will be useful to them uh, there's another question uh, there is a also i thought i also wanted uh, some uh, uh, you know inputs from your side because recently you know there are a lot of uh, 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 work moving towards using low cost sensors, and uh, people also started using your low cost sensor based air quality information. And uh, uh, there is a question on can we use a low cost sensor for identifying the hotspot? But uh, CPCB has made it very clear not to use uh, sensor based information for the uh, public uh, dissemination uh, in, in terms of air quality index. So, what's your comment on that one, sir? Well, that is CPCB's order. They 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 should comment on that, right? Isn't it? I think. <laughs> I, but all, all, all I know that the CPCB has two uh, committees, and uh, I happen to be a member of both committees. And one committee, uh, one committee was set up uh, as a response to a decision taken in the National Clean Air Program Steering Committee to do profiling in six cities using. The CAQMS, sorry, uh, using yes, CAQMS as a benchmark data and then combining that with the sen uh, census data, satellite data, and dispersion. I believe that you are aware of that and you are planning to contribute to that work in Chennai, correct? So that is, that is one uh, thing what CPCB is doing precisely to understand how the sensors will perform in six cities. Cities are identified, Chennai is one of them. Uh, Second, they have also set up another committee, which was again triggered from ministry, uh, is to, to prepare a guideline for hybrid monitoring network by combining optimal number of CHMS and sensors in the city. These are the two committees, which both, are, they, both of them are working and they need to take it forward. Yeah, thanks very much, sir. So there's one other question, like in terms of measurements, there are some of the techniques, uh, you know, very widely used, experienced, and now they have also started including some of the newer techniques, like although it is a light scattering, they just make sure that whatever the information is coming correct and uh, validate it properly. Uh, so now uh, uh, the CPCB has approved only three methods. Uh, there is no addition from 2009, but uh, there is a lot of uh, New new technologies are coming up. Uh, uh, do you feel that uh, uh, there is a need for, you know, looking at some of these things uh, in line with what EPA is doing? It. Oh, I think it's always good to look at the new technology, and uh, you know that's what uh, certainly will uh, keep us, uh, you know, up up to date. So uh, the regulator, the you know, ministry needs to. Uh, certainly engage the institutions and that's the idea behind you know connecting uh, the all the iurs to nkn with the ministry and regulators so if there are new development which are happening anywhere else it's important that we also do that but it's also important that we do in our own way we should also make a, do our own development right rather than always importing and copying it
Yeah, uh, there's one uh, question. Uh, uh, this uh, WHO has, has recently suggested to characterize particulates, including size, fraction, uh, so, uh, do, you, do you think that uh, we, we also should uh, look at it because in our measurements, uh, we never report these kind of things as a public information because it's more like a scientific uh, uh, information. So, uh, do you have any thoughts on that one? Uh, no, I think uh, as of now, I think we have some other challenges. We need to deal with them. Uh, WHO might be, you know, doing something. And I, I think it's okay for them to do. We should uh, first try to probably, uh, you know, have enough capacity in the country so that we can deal with our challenges. That is basically we have to make our air breathable in the country as per the norms set up by our country. Yeah. So th there's one uh, clarification again. Krishna has uh, wrote uh, back uh, this uh, batch trajectory uh, to identifying uh, the pollutant concentration because in the ground level measurements. And the trajectories are given information at uh, say about 50 meter, 100 meter, but we all the ground level measurements will be at uh, say about uh, three meters to four, five meters. So how do we get 50 meters projections, whatever the models makes, and uh, how it is valid to use the five meter measurement as an information? No, 50 meter basically trajectories generally hit the ground. The 50 meter uh, the, that uh, trajectory is generally what we consider them that they are either bringing thing on the ground or they are the one which is taking. So I think that fairly, I think, okay to, uh, you know, you use them, but if uh, he has something he can write, maybe a couple of my students do the CWT, I can put him in touch with them that how do they uh, solve this problem. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Just ask Krishna him Bhatti. to write yeah. mail to me. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll just uh, ask uh, uh, you know, Krishna if you have questions, uh, please uh, let us know, and uh, we will also write, inform to Prasad Tripathi, and uh, in turn, they will contact you uh, through the respective students to address your issues. Uh, so now I'll request uh, uh, Dr. Midi to summarize. And uh, thank you, Prasad Tripathi. It was a very honor and a proud moment for all of us to listen to you. Uh, thank you, Srivatsa, for giving me this opportunity. First, I would like to thank our eminent speaker and participants. And it will be my great honor to briefly summarize this talk. So in today's talk, the professor uh, tried to compare all uh, different type of uh, source apportionment techniques, uh, from starting from conventional techniques to using, uh, then he moves to the uh, his techniques used with uh, real-time sophisticated instruments. Then he uh, introduced us about the low cost source apportionment techniques. In uh, sophisticated techniques, he gave the, us uh, the introduction about HTR TOMS, uh, TOF uh, aerosol mass spectrometer and uh, exit uh, metal ambient monitor. So uh, they did their study at uh, Delhi and Lucknow and they compared different type of sources contributing there. And they used uh, highly sophisticated high resolution techniques like uh, high resolution time of flight aerosol mass spectrophotometer. And this type of uh, results can be useful to, to develop some regional uh, air quality policies. So this study is highly useful for all of us. And uh, then he compared the similarly he compared the elemental proportions at Delhi and uh, Lucknow using the uh, exact ambient uh, metal monitor. Then uh, he introduced another very interesting and new approach of source apportionment it, that is a uh, double PMF method. And uh, in last, uh, he introduced us about low cost uh, sensors, the different uh, sites where they have deployed these uh, low cost sensors and uh, their efficiencies and sensitivities. And uh, additionally, they have given us uh, the, uh, the idea about the uh, low cost guest sensors like ozone and NO2 and their sensitivity. And uh, so I hope this talk will be will enlighten all of us on all new researchers to think in new dimensions. Thank you so much. sir. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. So for your time and uh, your valuable uh, you know, thoughts and uh, inspiring several of the young uh, minds to work in this air quality management issues. Thank you very much. for uh, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shivana Gendra. It was really a pleasure to interact with you and all the people who have connected today. Thank you very much.
thanks we will also thanks to all the uh, you know participants for this super lecture uh, we'll see you in the next air quality management lecture series thank, thank you very much yeah see you sir tomorrow i think you are you are planning to come to chennai online yeah, online. online okay <laughs> thank you <laughs>